I'd like you to open them to the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, as the Apostle Paul addresses the early Christian church on a subject of very great importance. He used very strong language in doing it, and it carries as forceful a message today as when he first uttered it. Galatians, the first chapter. Verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel out of heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The Greek word there for accursed is about the strongest you can get in New Testament Greek. Anathema, under the divine damnation. If anybody preaches any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, count him under the curse of God. Verse 9, as we said before, just so you don't miss the point, I now say it again. If anyone preaches any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be cursed under the divine curse. Notice verse 8 says, we are an angel out of heaven. And then he says, if we come back to Galatia again, we the apostles, and we tell you a message other than the one we gave you the first time, count us damned by God. So if an angel materializes and the angel gives you another message, count the angel damned. If we come back, count us damned. The gospel is pure, undefiled, unchanging, so that even the apostles couldn't alter it. Even an angelic revelation couldn't change it. In Jude, verse 3, the scripture says, when I wrote to you, brethren, concerning the common salvation, it was necessary for me to urge you to put up a good fight for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. The gospel was given to the church once for all time before the close of the first century of the Christian era. There was no need for additional revelations. There was no need for additional extra-biblical sacred books. There was no need for prophets and prophetesses to arise and to give the church the gospel or to restore it to the earth because the faith had been once for all given to the church before the close of the first century. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, better known as the Mormons, building a temple here in Atlanta, one of the most powerful and the most rapidly growing of all non-Christian cults in the United States and in the world, began essentially with angelic revelation. The angel Moroni allegedly appeared to Joseph Smith, Jr. in 1823 in Palmyra, New York, and told him to go and dig in the hill Cumorah. Joseph went and dug and there he allegedly found plates of gold. On those plates in the reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics was what became the Book of Mormon as Joseph translated. He looked through miraculous stones and as he did the Urim and the Thummim from the Old Testament, then the characters turned into English and Joseph dictated these to his scribes. The angel Moroni brought in the message. The gospel had disappeared from the earth. And Joseph Smith was to be the one who restored the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is very significant that the Mormon church is composed of people who really believe that they are Christians. They do not believe they are Protestants. They do not believe that they are Catholics. They believe that they and they alone are the restored church of Jesus Christ on the earth. All other religions 
are false. Only Mormonism is the true faith. Joseph received what he called his first vision. There are five versions of the vision, and they all differ from each other. But the accepted version that Joseph uh, had, and which is now circulated by the church, is a very significant one. Because there, God the Father and Jesus Christ allegedly appeared to Joseph Smith, Jr. And they gave him a message. They told him that all of the professors of Christianity were corrupt. They told him that all of the creeds of Christianity were an abomination and that all of the sects of Christianity were wrong and that therefore Joseph should not join any of them. So with one sweep of the pen, all the churches, all the people, and all the creeds were eliminated. All that was left was Joseph and the church which he was supposed to perform. Now the Mormons are thrifty, hardworking, earnest, good neighbors, devout, and enormously successful in their business and economic pursuits. You cannot fault their success. They did suffer considerable persecution in their early days, and they did make a trek across the United States to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake after Joseph Smith, Jr. was assassinated. The church was founded in 1830 and now numbers 4.8 million persons with more than 30,000 full-time missionaries. They double every 10 years. That means if the Lord tarries, there will be 10 million Mormons by the year 1990, 20 million Mormons by the year 2000, and more than 100,000 missionaries at that time. The income of the church has been estimated at anywhere from three and a quarter to three and three quarter million dollars a day. Their assets exceed 10 billions of dollars, and they are an enormously successive, successful business empire. One cannot fault success. The Christian church does not quarrel with the Mormon people. There is a difference between the Mormon people and the Mormon church. The Mormon church claims to be the restored gospel, and the people believe the church, and they believe that they are Christians. I do not intend to spend my time attacking the Mormons, but spend my time, as the scripture says, putting everything that everybody says to the test and hanging on to what's good. First Thessalonians chapter 5, test all things. Hold on to what is good. The only way we know whether something is good or not is whether or not it checks out with the word of God. Now the Mormon church has grown, is successful, is powerful, and the Mormon church must be dealt with from the pulpit, in the seminary, on the mission field, and wherever it appears, because it is one of the leading challenges to evangelical Christianity. Now let us examine some common Mormon myths which the Mormon missionary will speak to you about when he knocks on your door after he has peddled up. The first is that the Mormon church is the only true church because it has the name